this program, we are going to focus on the importance of the reason we give a sinner to come to Jesus. That is, the motive we give them to come to the Savior, because their motive will determine whether or not they will fall away from the faith. They have the right motive for coming to Jesus, they'll stay. They have the wrong motive, they'll fall away. Seeking can save the lost the way Jesus did. There's only a certain amount of time left. Of time left. The best so use the ball, so use your pistol, reach out to the lost. Reach out to the lost. The There's nothing more important than your eternal salvation. get to know God, and you get to live with Him eternally, and you get a lot more blessings, a lot more good times. Christ is there to, to fill those pains in your life. Well, the reason being is um, peace in my heart. I mean, peace in your heart. You want peace in your heart. What do you want for your life? Do you, you want something that's incomplete? you want something that's not fulfilling? But mostly, it's it's what the Lord can do for you, because everybody is looking for their, their personal gain. I'm a non-Christian, living with my girlfriend. I'm deeply into pornography. I love beer. I'm having a good time. I've got a lot of money. What are you going to say to me? What are you living for? <laughs> my girlfriend, sex, pornography, booze, and my money. Love it. What happens when it dries up and she leaves you? I get some more. Where? I'm rich. I just say, you know, how awesome it is to be with God and that, you know, through Him we find the purpose in life and joy and peace. Well, uh, first of all, the joy. I, I love seeing people happy, so I say, listen, you're, you're sad. I want you to feel happy, and this is this is what can really make you completely happy. Everything can get better, you know. It can all all get better in, in heartbeat in an instant. Do you think non-Christians can be happy? To a certain point, they can feel happy, you know, but they can't. Sure, they can be happy. What are you going to tell me? Well, there's a guy named Jesus, and he loves you, and he wants to spend time with you, and he wants a relationship with you. And he stands at your heart every day, and he's knocking right now. So you have an opportunity. You can go that way, or you can keep doing what you want to do. It's your choice. The tragedy of modern evangelism is that around the turn of the last century, when the church forsook the law and its capacity to drive sinners to Christ, modern evangelism therefore had to find another reason for sinners to respond to the gospel. And the issue that modern evangelism chose was the issue of life enhancement. The gospel degenerated into Jesus Christ will give you peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. Now to illustrate the unscriptural nature of this very popular teaching, we would like you to listen very carefully to this following anecdote because the essence of what we're saying pivots on this particular point. Two men are seated on a plane. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on because it would improve his flight. Now the guy's a little skeptical at first because he can't see how putting a parachute on in a plane could possibly improve his flight. But after a while, he decides to experiment and see if the claim is true. And as he puts it on, he notices the weight of it on his shoulders and the fact that he can't sit straight up. But he comforts himself with the fact that he was told the parachute would improve his flight. And so he decides to give the thing a little time. And as he waits, he notices that some of the other passengers are laughing at him. And as they continue to point and laugh, he finally can't stand it any longer. He slinks in his seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it on the floor. Bitterness and disillusionment fill his heart because as far as he's concerned, he was told an outright lie. The second man is given a parachute, but listen to what he's told. He's told to put it on because at any moment he'd be jumping 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts the parachute on. He doesn't notice the weight of it upon his shoulders, nor that he can't sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without that parachute. Now let's analyze the motive and the result of both passengers' experience. The first man put on the parachute solely to improve his flight. And the result of his experience was that he was humiliated by the other passengers, he was disillusioned and bitter toward those who gave him the parachute. 
As far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before someone gets one of those things on his back again. Now, the second man put on the parachute solely to escape the jump to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him without the parachute, he has a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart knowing that he's going to be saved from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery from the other passengers, and his attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. Now listen to what the modern gospel says. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. So the sinner responds, and in an experimental fashion, puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? The promise, temptation, tribulation, and persecution. The other passengers mock him. So what does he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offended for the word's sake. He's disillusioned and somewhat embittered, and quite rightly so. He was promised peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness, and all he got were trials and humiliation. His bitterness is directed at those that gave him the so-called good news, his latter end becomes worse than the first, another inoculated and bitter backslider. I haven't read it for a while. I used to, since a lot of, like, a lot of stuff, like, within the last three years, I lost my cousins, my Nina, my grandpa, so it's like... Oh, well, that's what should have driven you to the script. Not really, it just drove me away from it even more. Were you once a Christian? Yeah. And you turned your back on the Lord because things went wrong? Yeah. I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church, and the worst people... And the worst, and the worst people that I've that I've encountered were in the church. So that's why I'm kind of reluctant to. I mean, because I've heard the same things over the baby and over again. Out with the so, so, but at the same time, it's like I have my own faith. And you know God? No, I have my own God, but I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say it to Addison, but I, I do believe in God, and I am a Christian. I'm just not an active 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 christian where i go to church and i'm in every sunday you just told me if you die in your sins you go to hell don't deceive yourself satan's a liar he'll blind your mind okay and, and if you die in your sins god will give you justice i don't want you to go to hell god doesn't want you to go to hell listen to this i'll say this is all the earnestness i can muster if your eyes and my eyes meet on judgment day and you're mm. still in your sins mm. i'm free from your blood and you'd say to me, why didn't you slap my face? I can't slap your face to wake you up. All I can do is slap you with words and say, come to your senses. Please consider your eternal salvation. Instead of telling people that Jesus improves the flight, we should be warning passengers they're going to have to jump out of the plane. That it's appointed for a man once to die, and then comes judgment. And when a person understands the horrific consequences of violating God's law, then they will run to the Savior to escape the wrath to come. And if we're true and faithful followers of Christ, that's what we'll be telling them, that there is wrath to come, just like Jesus did, like Peter and Paul did, like all of Scripture does. Acts 17.30 says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. You see, it's not an issue of happiness, but of righteousness.